hey, uh, so, you know, we've been seeing each other for a while now, and so I think it's time I pop the question. Are you rational? Hey everybody, welcome back to today's YouTube channel. Wait, why am I still wearing this? Welcome back to the channel. That intro was so stupid. In today's video, we're going to be talking about behavioral science principles. In fact, I'm going to be giving you my top five behavioral science principles that I think every beginner should know. So let's start with a very famous principle, loss aversion. So loss aversion is the idea that people feel the pain of losing much more than the pleasure of gaining. In fact, some studies have found that the difference is about double. So what that means is that if you were to lose $100, that would hurt twice as much as gaining $100 would be pleasurable. What that means for human behavior is that people are likely to go through great lengths to avoid losses because losing feels very painful. And as a result of that, people might make poor financial decisions. One example of this in the real world is insurance and warranties. A lot of people take out insurances and warranty policies for products that probably don't even need them, but they do it because the prospect of losing, that pain of losing is so real that they rather pay to avoid the potential of that feeling coming about. But as a result of that, they end up paying for something which they most likely will never need, and so they end up losing financially in this case. So that's an example of loss aversion being used all the time in the real world. Okay, so the second behavioral science principle is related to that first one, and that is the endowment effect. So the endowment effect is the idea that we value things that we own much more than equivalent things that we don't own. Now, the classic study on this was conducted by Nobel Prize winning behavioral economist Richard Thaler, the co-author of the book Nudge. And in this classic study, he divided one of his classes in two, and he gave half the class a mug, and he gave the other half of the class nothing at all. He then asked the half of the class who were given a mug, please write down how much you would be willing to sell your mug for. And he also asked the half of the class that weren't given a mug, how much would you be willing to pay for one of those mugs? Now, if information was perfect and people were valuing the mugs rationally, then those numbers should be very similar. After all, just a few minutes ago, nobody had a mug. However, that's not what they found. Instead, the people who were given a mug valued the mugs much higher than the people who weren't given a mug. And what that tells us is that the simple act of owning something makes us value it a lot more. Now, how does this play into our everyday lives and our everyday decision making? Well, one way that it can affect our decision making is it can cause us to hold on to things for too long. Because the endowment effect is at play in our minds, it means that we can hold on to things that we currently have far too strongly rather than letting them go and pursuing something that could be even better in the future. Okay, so principle number three is quite different to the first two. Now we're talking about people's beliefs. We're gonna be talking about confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is a very famous principle in behavioral science, and the simple idea is that people are more likely to seek information that agrees with their current point of view and disregard or underweight information that contradicts their current point of view. There have been many studies that have looked into this. Some really interesting findings have come out of the back of them. For example, in this study, participants were asked if they thought that video games caused violence and then they read an article that was very balanced on both sides with some arguments saying that video games might cause violence and some arguments saying that video games don't. At the end of this exercise participants were asked again how strongly do you agree that video games cause violence and what they found was that the people who went into the article believing that video games did cause violence left reading the article with an even stronger belief that video games cause violence and the converse was also true if they went in thinking that video games didn't cause violence they then came away from that article believing even more strongly that video games didn't cause violence so what confirmation bias tells us is that just showing people information or news or articles that is very balanced in its point of view won't solve this polarization issue because this is something which is ingrained into our psychology that means we tend to pay more attention and Pay, place more emphasis on things that agree with us and less emphasis and less attention on things that disagree with us. Okay, so number four is mental accounting. Mental accounting is the simple idea that we allocate money in our brains to different purposes, just kind of different pots, uh, depending on what we want to spend that money on. Now, this is quite useful most of the time because it helps us, you know, avoid overspending on different things. However, it can lead to some pretty poor financial decisions 
Let me give you an example. So one example might be if somebody was saving up for, say, a car, they might have an account with a lot of savings in it, which they've mentally accounted as the car account, the one that they're going to pay for their new car with. However, at the same time, they might also be in credit card debt. And as a result of being in credit card debt, they're accruing all of these you know, charges, but because of mental accounting, they don't want to touch their pot of money, which is reserved for the car. And so they end up paying for these charges on the credit card debt account while having all of these savings in the car car account. Now in reality money is of course fungible which means that it can be used across many different uses and your money doesn't have to be used for a specific purpose and so a more rational decision would be for someone to take some money out of that car account and use it to pay off the credit card debt so they're not paying all of these charges which will actually mean they uh, have more money in the future in general. But because of mental accounting we see this kind of silly behavior happening all the time which leads to poor financial decisions. Okay, so number five is defaults. One of the most famous behavioral science principles It's the simple idea that if something is pre-checked for us, if something is sort of pre-selected for us, we're more likely to go with that option. In fact, significantly more likely to go with that option. Now, there are many different examples that I could give you, but let me give you sort of a real practical one from the Behavioral Insights team, which is one of the uh, nudge units here in the UK. So in 2012, the Behavioral Insights team was working with a major retailer called Argos and Homebase. For my American audience, Homebase is like the British version of Home Depot and they were working with their employees. Specifically, they were trying to get Argos and Homebase employees to contribute to the payroll giving program. And this was a program where employees would voluntarily give up a certain percentage of their monthly income to go to charitable causes. Now, previously, this was an opt-in service where employees would have to opt in to giving to charity, but the default was that they were not going to be giving a percentage of their income to these charitable causes. However, the Behavioral Insights team changed this default. So now employees had to opt out of this system. So by default, these employees were giving a certain percentage of their income to charitable causes. Now before the default switch, participation in this program was about 10%. But after simply switching this default over to being an opt-out service rather than opt-in, they managed to increase contribution from 10% to 49%. So almost half of all employees were now on this scheme versus just 10% before. And this very simple switch led to a massive difference in the contributions to charitable causes uh, that these two organizations were giving. In fact, the difference was about three million pounds per year towards charity. So you can see how behavioral science can be used for good sometimes with just some very simple tweaks. So those are five principles in behavioral science. Do you think you're good at behavioral science yet? Well, you're probably not because boom, sixth bonus principle and that is overconfidence. Overconfidence again is one of the most universal principles here in behavioral science. And it's just the very simple idea that in general, humans are overconfident about how good they are at doing certain things. One very famous example of this was when people were asked, are you better than average at driving? And when people are asked this question, over 50% of people said that they're better than average. But of course, statistically speaking, that's impossible. So why is this happening? Well, it's because when you ask the very general question, are you better than average at driving? People might think of the different attributes that might make them convince themselves that they are better at driving. For example, one person might say, I'm very good at sticking to the rules. I always stick to the speed limit. I'm a very safe driver. Whereas another person might say, well, I'm really good at handling. I can drive really fast and control the car still. I'm really good at turning corners quickly. So, you know, these two people have very different perspectives about what a good driver is, but they're each convincing themselves that they're better than average. Now, the reason why humans have evolved like this is because in general, being overconfident will be better for you in the long run. For example, take two identical people, one of them is really overconfident and one of them is really underconfident. Obviously, the person who's more overconfident is going to take more risks, is going to go for more things, try more things, and therefore is most likely to have a more fulfilling and more successful life than the person who is underconfident. So overconfidence in general is a good idea, but of course it can backfire on us if the risk is too great. So the way we think about overconfidence in behavioral science is when there is a really a serious downside to something going wrong if our confidence is misplaced. So if you're ever making a decision where if something goes wrong, it's going to be really bad for you, just remember you're probably overconfident and therefore adjust your decision accordingly. Okay, so that wraps up today's video, guys. There's a five behavioral science principles that I think every beginner should know, plus one bonus principle, overconfidence. I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, please give me a thumbs up down below because it really helps me out. Subscribe if you haven't already. I make behavioral science videos here every single week. 
and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.